Hey there, I'm so glad that you decided to watch today. My name is Matt and I'm the online director here at Grace. And whether you are joining us live or on replay today, I hope that by the end of the service, you'll feel just a little bit more encouraged and refreshed. If this is your first time with us, welcome. I'm glad that you're checking us out and I would love the chance to connect with you. Just text NEW to the number that you see on your screen. And this week, I'll send you a small gift just to say thank you. And now we're gonna be joining Pastor Sean for the teaching, followed by a couple of songs. And then I'll let you know some other ways that you can connect with us throughout the week. Enjoy the service. Hi, my name is Sean. I'm the pastor here at Grace Church. Thanks for being a part of our services this weekend. We're glad that you're here. Uh, we're in the fourth week of a series in James. It's got, it's got five chapters in it. Uh, we've got uh, two more weeks after this one. So what we did is uh, James kind of uh, changes topics halfway through chapter three to the begin first half of chapter four. Uh, so that's how we're, we're dividing up our uh, series, not necessarily based on the chapters as much as the themes in those chapters. And he opens up uh, his letter to the church by saying, uh, we're, all gonna, we're all gonna fall on hard times, which dispels the myth that I think most people have uh, somehow, regardless of what the religion is, that if I start getting religious, that my problems should start to go away, that if I come back to church or if I get my life right with God, he should start fixing my problems and keep keep me from them. And James dispels that right off the front and says, hey, my name is James, and by the way, when you fall into the same problems that everybody else falls into, <laughs> he says, I want you to look at your problems differently. That's, that's the difference between Christians and non-Christians. It's not whether or not we have hard times. It's not whether or not we have conflict in our marriage or in our relationship with our kids or our parents or our roommates, boyfriends, girlfriends. Uh, lose best friends, gain best friends. That's, that's not the difference. The difference is, 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 is our attitude uh, as we step into those moments. It's the way we go through hard times. It's not whether or not we go through hard times. And he says that we, we all go through hard times. We... Uh, but those who are followers of Jesus, we, we intentionally grow through those hard times and we find purpose in it. Then in chapter 2, he says now, uh, it's important that you recognize whether or not your faith is genuine. Because if your faith is genuine, if you truly have accepted Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, that he died on the cross as a payment for your sins, uh, was buried, but rose from the dead with new life to give you new life, if you have genuinely repented, changed your mind about the direction of your life, about the filter through which you make decisions, and how you live your life, then you should see a difference. That the transformation that's happening in your heart should show itself in the things that you do, he says in chapter 2, and in things that you say in chapter 3. At the end of chapter 3, he says, he gives us one more and he says, it should also change your motives. And that's what we're gonna be looking at uh, today. So in James chapter three, verse 12, here's what he says. He says, does a fig tree produce olives or does a grapevine produce figs? No, it's, an, it's, a, it's a rhetorical question. No, of course not. And you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. So what comes out of you uh, proves what was in you. So if I'm a Christian, you should be able to tell by the things that I do and what I say. Uh, but then at the rest of this chapter, he says, but there's going to be something that only you're going to be able to judge about yourself. Uh, other people can judge the quality of the things that I do and the things that I say. And uh, I, I know that we say uh, that we, we shouldn't judge each other, but the scripture says judge not so that you won't be judged. Because the way that you judge other people, the stick that you use to measure other people is the same measurement by which you'll be measured. So we can tell, Jesus even said that you can be able to, you can tell whether, you can tell a, a tree by its fruit. You can tell it's an apple tree because it's growing apples. You can tell that it's a banana tree because it's growing bananas. I mean, those are obviously completely, there's other ways that you can tell that those are different types of tree trees, but Jesus said you can tell what type of a tree it is by the fruit that it grows. And that's all James is acknowledging. But he's going to say, but what he's about to say is that this fruit is coming from a place. So if you're concerned about the place where the things that you're saying and doing is coming from, then I, I hope today's teaching is helpful to you. Um, most of us, if we're going to be transparent, would would probably we kind of fudge the scorecard a little bit when it comes to evaluating ourselves. I, I do think that I tend to judge others more harshly than myself, and that's because I know 
the reasons why I did what I did and I don't know the reasons they do what they do, so I'll assign motivations to them. And I'm most likely probably to assign negative intentions to other people's actions while assigning positive intentions to mine. We, we do cut ourselves a little bit more slack than we, than we give to others. We, we all do this. And if you're shaking your head, no, you're lying right now. Like we all, we all do this. Like we, we do, we do give ourselves a little bit more credit than, than what we give to other people. And it's not that I'm saying that we shouldn't have a positive image of ourselves, or that we shouldn't think of ourselves uh, with a, a healthy uh, estimation. The Bible says that you're creating the image of God. So God says that you have value. Like you, you bear the thumbprint of God as a person that while your mom and dad might not have intended or known of your existence until the doctor told them that you were coming, uh, the Bible says that God knew about your existence before he laid the foundation of the world. So while you might be an accident from this perspective of your biological parents, you were intentional from God's perspective. Your life has meaning and you have intrinsic value. So much so that the Bible says that God loves you enough that he sent Jesus, that he himself shows up in human history in the person of Jesus to take on uh, the consequences of our sin against the standard and our sins against each other so that we could be reconciled to him. So you, you have value. You are worth something. But sometimes our estimation of ourselves is still a little bit more inflated than what it ought to be. Sometimes, because of our blind spots, we lack, uh, we lack, we lack a little bit of self, self-awareness. And that's what he's going to get to here in verse 13 of chapter 3. He says, if you are wise and understand God's ways, and I think most of us would think that we're pretty smart. Uh, I don't know how many of us think, oh, I'm dumb. Like, all of us think that we're we're, we're, we're intelligent people. Every, you know, funny, like everybody thinks they're a little bit above average, but like everybody thinks this. So, I mean, for it to be average, half the population has to be less than that, while the other half of the population would be a little bit above that. But I think everybody thinks they're in the top half, which is, I think, mathematically impossible if I'm doing my maths right. But he says, if you are wise and if you understand the ways of God, if you call yourself a Christian, uh, then prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works. And that's a summary of everything he had just said over the past couple of chapters. He said, if you're, if you genuinely are a person of faith, if you have repented of your sins, then your heart has been transformed. And if your heart has been transformed, then so will your life. Your life will be transformed. But I think after talking about all of these things we have to do and all of these things that we have to say, there might be a concern in the heart of James that now we're just creating a new checklist of things we got to do to prove that we're a Christian. So he's wanting us to get to the place where we recognize that it's still not about the checklist of all the stuff that we have to do to perform. It still is about the place where our performance is coming from. So he adds something to the narrative in the second half of this verse. He says, if you're wise and understand God's ways, prove it by living an honorable life, doing good works with humility that comes from wisdom. Now, wisdom was mentioned in the first chapter. He says, if you're not sure what to do, or where to go next, or how you should respond to something, he said, then you should ask Ask God for wisdom, and if you ask God for wisdom, he'll not hold it back. But if you're going to ask God for wisdom, then you have to be committed to doing whatever it is that God puts in your heart to do. He said, because if you're just looking for extra options, then you're asking with a double-mindedness that God won't respond to. So if you have asked God for wisdom and you have this kind of wisdom, then there's a spirit in which you'll do the things that you do and say the things that you say, and that spirit is humility. You'll do these things from a place of, of humility. It's something that he adds, so it's not just the things that he, we do, because the good things that we do must be coming from a good kind of place. So how can I tell whether or not the things that I'm doing are, come from, are coming from a place of humility? I'm like, it, it's kind of a, a hard thing for me to assess about myself whether or not I'm humble. Because isn't it a truth that once I get to the place where I say I am humble, 
I am no longer humble? I mean, or is that even true? Like I'm the most humble person. I'm, I'm the more humbler. I'm the most humblest, right? Like I, I don't like it. This is a difficult thing for us to assess about ourselves. So how in the world do I measure my humility? And, and what, is hum, what do we even mean when we say humility? Because I think some of us think that if I'm a humble person, what that means is that I think less of myself, that I think, that I think, um, that I'm that other people are better than me and that I'm a piece of crap and and I'm no good and this is what humility looks like and everybody else is is better than me but I like what what Rick Warren he's a pastor uh, who wrote that book Purpose Driven Life that was really famous um, back in the late 90s so half of you have no idea what I'm talking about but there's just a well-known pastor who once said that humility is not thinking less of yourself it's thinking of yourself less you're just not so self-minded. That's what humility is. Self, hum, humility is the idea that I am aware of the value, the good, the intrinsic worth of everybody around me all the time and God's kingdom purposes in the world. And I, I don't necessarily work to subjugate those around me and their agendas to me and mine and my agenda. And I'm willing to submit myself and my agenda to God's will and his agenda rather than trying to game the religious system so that God gets me more of what I want. I wrote down that humility is recognizing that my opinion, my perspective, and my rights aren't any more important than your opinion, your perspective, and your rights. It's it's not that I can't say that this is objective truth and I've found this and and what you're saying isn't true. So I, I'm not allowed to say that this is right and that's wrong. We're talking about opinions, not God's truth. I mean, if God says it, obviously it's, it's right. What I'm saying is that my opinion, my perspective, uh, and my rights are, are any more valuable than or more important than your opinion, your perspective, and your rights. And that's incredibly, incredibly difficult. How, how do I even begin to assess my own humility. And James gives us the answer in the next verse because he says, here's what you should look for. And what he gives us are the warning lights that tells us that we lack humility. So if I, going through his little four, four point checklist, if I see these things in my life and in my heart, then that's how I know that I'm, I'm not coming from a place of humility. Uh, and then my, my focus now isn't my actions, it's my, my focus now is my heart. And we're gonna see that in verse 14, James 3 verse 14. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, then be honest about it. But don't try to ignore it or cover it up by adding to it boasting or arrogance and lying. So now I'm going to lean on your ability to be self-aware and ask you to check yourself on the same four things that James said you needed to check yourself on. The first is this jealousy. Now, I don't think any of us would say, oh, I'm a jealous person, I'm a jealous person. But, but here's, the, here's the honest question that's going to uncover the dirt that's probably there to some degree in your heart when it comes to jealousy. How much are you driven by what other people have? So I don't care what other people have. Stop it. Like, I don't even think that that's a true statement. Like it's true that, uh, like Billy Jane and I were in Miami for vacation a couple of weeks ago and we paid that $25 to go on the boat tour uh, around all the little islands just in between Miami Beach and, and the city of Miami. And we got to see, you know, J-Lo and, and uh, Alex Rodriguez, A-Rod's house that they bought together three months before they split up. Uh, but they still own. We got to see, uh, you know, Ricky Martin's place. We got to see, uh, it doesn't matter. We got to see movie stars, athletes, uh, celebrities, uh, rock stars. We get to see all of their homes. And, and I don't care when somebody I don't know has way more than me. I'll tell you what's difficult. What's difficult is when somebody I work with makes more than me. How about you? Right? Like that's, ah, woo! And you're just like, Sean, now you're poking me in the eye. And see, because I, I can't see you face to face right this second, I don't actually know that I'm poking you in the eye. But like, that's the thing we have a hard time with. Her. When I see somebody or hear about somebody who's not even famous, who's gotten more chances than I've gotten 
to go farther than what I've gone? I'll ask questions sometimes like, well, how old are they? Because if they're 55, like if they're older than me, then it's okay that they've had more chances. I'll tell you what I've had a hard time with is when somebody is like 10 years younger than me and they've gone farther faster than me. I Because I, I feel like, man, it's, it's just not fair, right? Like I, it's like the kid who's okay with his toy until he sees somebody else playing with their toy and enjoying it more and now the kid's not happy with his own toy. Or like in, uh, um, uh, what is it, the uh, Count of Monte Cristo, uh, Fernand, uh, and then um, Mondego, the Count of Mondego, is that, was that, is that his name? Is that, Fernand is the friend, and uh, I forget, it's been a long time since I've seen it, but the poor guy had a whistle, and then the rich guy had a pony, uh, but the rich kid didn't want his pony anymore when he saw how much the poor kid loved his whistle. Now all he wanted was a whistle, and I don't think uh, that, that that impulse uh, go, goes away. I, I don't think it does. Uh, because we're, like, you have enough, you're paying your bills right now, but it's it's still not enough because we know people who have a lot more. And uh, I, I think I think that's just something that we have to be aware of is the jealousy that's, that's in our heart that motivates us. And then he says selfish ambition. And it's not that ambition is bad. Uh, I was working at a church and I asked the pastor, is it a bad thing that um, I want to be the most successful youth pastor ever, that I want to be a successful youth pastor? And he said, Sean, if you didn't want to be good at the thing that God had called you to do, then I wouldn't want you on staff in our church. But then he said, what I think is really good is that you're at least asking that question. Right? So I think that you should want to be great at what you do. The question is, why do you want to be great at it? Do you need to be great at it? Do you need to be seen as great at it? Do you need to be recognized for being great at this. And if you do need, and, and just be honest, like I'm not asking you to give me the answer to this question. This is a question that you're supposed to ask yourself. If you do, if you're gonna be completely like self-aware about this and you do want to be seen as, if I do want to be known as a great church planter, as a great pastor, why is it, Sean, that it's so important to you that you're invited to speak at conferences? Why is that important to you, right? Like if we're gonna be like for real, real, why is that important? Because if I'm going to be completely transparent, there's a part of me that wants to be great and it has nothing to do with God's agenda. It has everything to do, it has everything to do with mine. So what are you doing with what you already have and why do I want more? Uh, then, he, then he says, don't cover it up by adding to it arrogance. And I think this is a tough one. What helps me is by asking this question. Do other people think that I'm arrogant? Because that's probably, and, and I can tell, if you're self-aware, and I, I think all of us are probably to some degree self-aware, and that just means that we are aware of the way that other people perceive us and our actions and our interaction with them. Do other people think that I'm, I'm arrogant and I don't, I, I don't like the answer that I'm giving myself in my own heart right now, um, right? And all this, all this does is say that the stuff that I'm doing, if I'm not careful, if I don't fix this, then this is going to end up just becoming a checklist that I do so that other people will think a certain thing about me. And I've kind of defeated the purpose of the entire book, the, le the purpose of the, of the letter of the book of James. And then lying, what keeps me from being more honest and sincere uh, in, in what I say to other people and, and how I cover, cover up. Then verse 15, he says, For jealousy and self-awareness are not God's kind of wisdom. Such things are earthly, unspiritual, and watch this, are demonic. Uh, this spirit of jealousy that I have, when I'm worried about how old is that person? Like, are, are they getting that stuff before my age? What is everybody else making around me who's doing what I'm doing at my level of influence. That, that's the spirit that Satan had that got him kicked out, the spirit of arrogance he had, uh, the spirit of lying. Jesus referred to the Pharisees one time. He said that you guys are liars like your father, the devil. I believe that that's in John chapter 8, verse, verse 44. And this ambition, not just to be successful at, at what God's called me to do, but to be seen as successful and to be recognized for that, is, is the spirit of Satan. And so what he does now is then he compares and contrasts the evidence for a heart that's driven by wisdom that comes from God uh, versus uh, a spirit which comes from 
uh, which is like the spirit of, of Satan. So apart from God, uh, the wisdom that comes from the world is, is full of jealousy, selfish ambition, arrogance, and lying. And then in chapter 17, he gives me something to contrast that with. And he says, but the wisdom from above is first of all pure, it's peace-loving, it's gentle at all times, it's willing to yield to others, and it's full of mercy uh, and the fruit of good deeds. It shows no favoritism and is always pure. So apart from God, my motives are going to be uh, jealousy, selfish ambition, arrogance, and lying. But then the closer I lean into my relationship with God, the healthier my relationship with God is, then my motives are going to start to become more pure, more self less, others-centered, God-centric, the more my actions and my motives will be uh, peace-loving and gentle, the more reasonable I'm going to be with people and the more mercy I'm going to show to other people uh, when they violate uh, what I expect from them. And that's the self-test. Like, that, that's, that's it. And I don't I don't know that I necessarily pass that if I'm going to be transparent with you. Uh, so the question is, would I describe my motives as being pure, as peace-loving, gentle, reasonable, and merciful? Or maybe the better question is, would other people describe the spirit of Sean as being pure? Would other people say that Sean's motives are pure? Would other people say that Sean's motives come from a place of peace and, ten and tending for me, peace-loving? Would they say that my motives are gentle, that I am reasonable, and that I display mercy? I'm going to I'm going to get to the this, the back half of this by sharing three different truths that it gives us now, because our motives are going to determine what happens uh, with the lives, and as a result, uh, what happens to us as a result of of those motives. And the first truth that he gives us is that sometimes we don't have what we want because we look in the wrong place. And right here I move to chapter 4. And in James chapter 4 verse 1 he says, "What is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires that are at war within you? You want what you don't have." That's speaking to that jealousy part, right? So you scheme and kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war. You scheme, you take plans, you work against other people to take away from them. Yet you don't don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. I don't see God as the source of what I want and what I need. I see what you have and what others have to offer me as the source of what I want and what I need. I see my career as the path to get what I want and what I need. I see my money as a source of getting what I want and what I need. I don't see God as the source of this. And James says you're going to constantly be at odds with other people no matter how successful you become. No matter the estimation of you in the eyes of other people, you gain if you don't see God as the source of what you want and what you need. Verse 3 says, And even when you ask God for those things, you don't get it from God because your motives are all wrong. You want only what will give you pleasure. There's a struggle in each of us over what we have versus what we want. Am I right? Where we are versus where we are. Feel we need to be. And James says that this isn't an economic problem as much as it is a spiritual problem. The problem is not pleasure, but that pleasure is the only thing or the driving thing and what I want. That's what he says. What other motivations do I have? Like I need to be honest with myself. How do those motivations rank? What is it that I'm asking of God and why is it that I want or I feel I need those things? Some of us are asking God to bless us in ways that God will not answer. Why? Because God knows the motivation of my heart. There's a, a pastor, his name is Albert Tate. He tweeted this actually this week and here's what he said. Some of us desire to do big things but we're not fueled by the right thing. <coughs> <coughs> right? Like I'm <laughs> just like like he just like cold cocked me right in the chin, man. Just like sucker punched me. He said, some of us want to just do big things. Like I want to do big things. He says, you want to do big things, but we're not fueled by the right thing. And I'm like, oh, shoot. Like I don't, like maybe that's me. I want to finish the quote. He says, some of us desire to do big things, but we're not fueled by the right thing. Our motivation must be fueled by a burden, not just a benefit. That's what James is saying. 
There's nothing wrong with wanting more if wanting more comes from a burden that God has placed in your heart to further advance his kingdom purposes in the world. But if the motivation is just the accumulation of the benefit, then I don't know that that's anything God's ever going to do. And that leads me to the second truth, which is this. Sometimes we don't get where we want to go because God is standing in the way on purpose. We don't get where we want because God is standing in the way. James chapter four, verse four says this. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? My wife was talking to me about that early, early this morning. Uh, she had actually read a verse from the Bible app that sends her a text with a, a different Bible verse every single day. And it was like a little passage that she had read and she was thinking about, and it was about becoming uh, an enemy of God. And she said, I always thought that it was really harsh that God would then begin to see me as an enemy. But as I was praying through this verse, it's not that God made me an enemy. He says, I made myself an enemy. God and the world are standing on opposite teams. And when I choose to be on the team that chases everything everybody else is chasing for the purposes for which everybody else is chasing them, I have chosen a team that opposes God. I made myself the enemy of God. I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, verse 4, you make yourself an enemy of God. You made yourself the enemy of God. So it's not that God says, I hate you, you are my enemy. But God is now opposing you because what you're chasing is contrary to what he's been planning. That's the problem. What if what you're chasing is contrary to what God has planned? Are you willing to stop chasing it? That, bro, that's the money question right there. Are you willing to stop chasing what you're chasing? If God's Spirit told you that this isn't what God was planning. Verse 5, do you think the scriptures have no meaning when it says that God is passionate, that the spirit that he's placed within you should be faithful to him? Or your Bible might say that, that, that God is passionate, that the spirit uh, he has placed within you has become filled with envy. Like, this is not the heart that God wanted you to have. It's just the heart that you developed. And are you not concerned with the fact that this is something that bothers God about the way that you think and feel? What drives the decisions that you make? And then, so that you're not filled with guilt and shame, he says in the last part of this, he says, and he gives, verse 6, he gives grace generously. As the scripture says, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. The world and God stand on opposite sides, and God calls us to act in opposition to our worldly, our carnal, and our self-serving interests. So, who or what you love most will determine whether or not you follow God. How can I tell whether or not I love God most or love the world most? Because I think that that's, that's, that's the whole point of, of chapter 4 here. Uh, if the Bible clearly teaches that the first 10% of your income belongs to God, do you give it to Him or not? Because if you do or if you don't, that tells you whether or not you love the world more than you love God. If the Bible clearly teaches you to be sexually abstinent until you are married to someone of the opposite sex, do you obey God sexually or not? Because that says whether or not you love you and the world more than God or not. If the Bible says to forgive those who have hurt you, have you forgiven them or not? That will reveal whether or not you have chosen to become too friendly with the world and have now made yourself an enemy of God. If the Bible says to honor your parents, to take care of the needy, to serve the needs of your spouse, to worship weekly with your church family, to pray daily, and to love your enemies, do you or not? Because this tells you whether or not you've made yourself an enemy or an opponent of God. What if Jesus meant what he said, or what if we believed 
Jesus meant what he said when he said, come to me, all you who are heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. What if we actually believe that Jesus meant what he said when he said the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and to destroy, but my purpose is to give you a rich and satisfying life? What if we actually believed that Jesus meant what he said when he said, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you're willing to give up your life for my sake and the gospels, you will find it. If we actually believed Jesus meant what he said, we would probably do things differently. The good news, though, is right there at the beginning and the end of verse 6, where he says, he gives grace generously. So God knows we're going to struggle with this. And the point in sharing all of this with us isn't to heap all these crappy feelings on us, but motivate us to trust God enough to turn the direction of our heart away from the direction it's been going so that we can get what he says at the end of verse 6, where is, is that God exalts uh, the, the, the humble, that he gives grace to the humble, that he gives grace generously and he gives it to the humble. And that brings me to the third and final truth, and that's this. So while sometimes, uh, it said, uh, sometimes we don't have what we want because we're looking in the wrong place, sometimes we don't get where we want to be because God is standing in the way, all of the time, God puts us right back into the right spot when we get our hearts right. And that's the last part of this chapter. So humble yourselves before God. If you find yourself in any of these ways in conflict with the direction that God is wanting you to go, what should I do? Humble yourself. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, not actual hands, right? But like wash the dirt off of you. You sinners, purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. And it is, right? Our loyalty really is divided between things like God and our money, God and our sexuality, God and our past, God and our spouse, God and our agenda, God and what I want, God and, right? Like insert the thing you're most tempted to say God, to tell God no over. He's right, we're divided in our loyalties between God and those things. So he says, if that's where you're at, then let there be tears for what you've done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Right here's the golden ticket, the secret sauce, the hidden treasure and the holy grail, right? Like truthfully, all of us want to be genuinely happy in life. And the truth is, what was it? Was it was Tom Brady that said this? No, Tom, not Tom Brady. It was uh, Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey said, "Tom Brady and Jim Carrey are nothing alike." Jim Carrey had said, "I wish everybody could get everything that they ever want to have, so that once they get it, they can find what I found." And that's that it doesn't make you truly happy. Because you and I want more money until we get more money. Then what do we want? We want more money. And you want to have sex with that person, and then you have sex with that person, and then you want sex with that person. And then all of us, we hang on to our grudges because that person doesn't deserve, doesn't deserve to be forgiven. And I, and I saw, I, I saw a, a, a meme this past week about, about grudges and said, those of us who hold on to grudges uh, we're like people who are hugging cactuses. It makes other people not want to get close to us. and We're only stinging ourselves, right? Like if you were to actually trust God, you would find that God would actually bring your heart to the place that you thought all of these other, place, these, these other things would, would get you. James didn't write this book to discourage you, to give you a guilt trip, or to add shame to our already convicted conscience. He wrote this book to point us down the path to being honored by God. What does he say to do? To humble yourself before God. What does that mean? To recognize God's authority in your life and commit to obeying him in every area of your life. He says to resist the devil, to resist sin. Just stop. Get an accountability partner. Set a reminder to do something else instead of the things that you were going to be doing. 
Make an attempt to spend time with God. Draw close to God and he will get close to you. Spend time with God and God will be spending time with you. Repent from your sin again, he says. Keep your heart. Uh, check your motives. And then he says again, genuinely repent of your sin and again humble yourself before God. So are you wise and do you want to understand the ways of God? Does the spirit behind your actions prove that? Not to anybody else, because only you know your motivations. When you look at your heart, do you see jealousy, selfish ambition, arrogance, and lying? The antidote for jealousy and greed is generosity. The antidote to selfish ambition is a celebration of the success of others. The antidote to arrogance is humility. The antidote to lying is transparent, honest self-evaluation. Why do you want what you want? And what do you want more than God? Some of you honestly might just be resisting God uh, completely. So the, the, it's not the idea that you need to resist sin. You need to stop resisting God. You feel some kind of way in your heart. Maybe you already believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead and everything I said at the beginning, you said, yeah, I believe that. Satan believes in God. Satan believes Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead because he saw it happen. The difference is that Satan will not change his mind about the things that he does and submit to the will of God with the rest of his life. And I don't know, maybe you won't either. Or maybe you will. And maybe this is your opportunity to do that. Maybe, maybe you're tired of running from God. Maybe you don't like where all of this is taking you in your heart and you're tired of the way that you feel on the inside and you recognize I am here because I'm trying to get something I don't have. I need God. And if you do, dear God in heaven, embrace him. Tell God right now. Close your eyes while you're listening to me and tell God that you believe that Jesus died on the cross and rose from the dead to pay for your sins and give you new life and tell God you want it. Ask him to forgive you for all of your sin and to save you from the consequences of it. And commit to God your willingness to change your mind about the direction that your life is going and commit to obeying him with the rest of your life. You're not saying I'll be perfect, but God, I'm gonna stay on track. When I go off track, I'm gonna get back on track. Dear God in heaven, help me follow you, Jesus, with the rest of your life. I am all in. Save me, God. Make that your prayer. Can I lead you, those of you who are followers of Jesus, through a prayer of humility in closing? I'm going to ask everybody, if you would, to bow your head, to close your eyes with me. And while your head is bowed and your eyes are closed right now, tell God that you recognize his authority in your life. God, I know that you are the one who created me. I know that I belong to you, that I'm created in your image. You're not created in mine, that I belong to you that you deserve, you deserve in me a person who is submitted to follow your direction with the rest of my entire life. God, I recognize that. The next part of the prayer, God, show me the motives that are in my heart. Like I genuinely want to be good at what I do. Help me to recognize whether or not my motive for wanting to be great are good or not. Show me the why behind my what. And if God is showing you the whys that ought not to be there, then you ask God to help you put a different why in there and let that change the things that you do in your pursuit of the what. God, show me if there's any sin in my heart and repent of it when he does and commit to spending time getting close to God on a daily basis. God, help me to remember to spend time with you on a regular basis. Change me from the inside out. God, I am all yours. Help me to discover the life you intended for me. This is the prayer that we ask in the name of Jesus. And we all say together, amen. Thanks for being a part of our services today. Really glad that you're here. I'm going to ask you to do me a favor. If you're new or new-ish to Grace Church, would you text the word new to the number that's on the screen? And if a few minutes ago, you did call on God to forgive you and save you, you did stop resisting God and you embraced him. God, I really genuinely want to follow you with the rest of my life and to give you my heart. I'm all in. Would you text the word all in to the number that's on the screen? I want to send you a link to some resources that are going to help you grow in your relationship with God. 
If you are a Christian, you're new to our church family, you want to put God first in every area of your life, one of the ways that we do this, Jesus actually said that this sets the temperature for our heart, is in our willingness to actually yield the most important thing to us, which is often outside of our family, our money, and use those things for God's kingdom purposes, and we do this to a local church. This isn't about what a church gets from you. Whether or not you do this isn't going to change anything about our church, but it is going to change everything about your heart. If you're a follower of Jesus, you already get this. You can text the word GIVE to the number that's on the screen, um, and we'll send you the link that you can begin doing that. And because of the people who are already doing this, if you're a part of our services this weekend and you're in financial need, just let us know. So if you don't have any groceries in your pantry, about to have a utility shut off, or your kids need sneaker, or you need an air sneakers, or you need an air conditioner for your baby's bedroom, or something like that. Please reach out to us. We do use this money for God's kingdom purposes in the world, and we're willing to do this in your world also. Uh, if you need prayer, if there's anything else we can do, just let us know. That's what we're here for. God bless, and hopefully we'll see you next week. the king.
spring of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my soul. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my soul. Cause you are good, good, oh, 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 the key. Hey, thank you for watching today and I hope that you were able to get something valuable that will help you through this next week and help you grow closer to God. If you'd like to share with me what that was, you can shoot me a text so I can encourage you in the next step. Just use the number that you see at the bottom of your screen. Also, if you've got something that's weighing heavy on you or you're worried about something or if you're just having a rough week and need some prayer and support, I'd love to do that for you. Text the word prayer to that same number and I'll reach out to you and see how I can be praying for you and supporting you throughout this next week. I hope that I'll see you guys again.